I found a lot of secret details in season 1 of Better Call Saul, so let's go over the 10 episodes of this season to figure out the details that make this series so great. Let's go with the first one. In episode 1 of Better Call Saul, we get this scene. Most folks in Cicero were scared of winter, but not Jimmy. There's a really small detail here, which is Jimmy doing this when he sees the bike like getting startled, that's really important. But there's three things that you need to know to really appreciate this detail. The first one is that in this episode, we see that Jimmy has a lot of traits of a narcissist. Now, a narcissist isn't exactly what we think it is. You know, this guy who is so proud, who sees himself as really a really great person, who loves himself so much, basically Walter White. <laughs> but that, that isn't exactly true. That's a type of narcissist, but it, it doesn't really define narcissism well. Narcissism is really just the inability to distinguish the real world from yourself, meaning that you see the world not as something outside of you, but really just as an extension of yourself. Because of this, anything that happens in the world, you think that it has something to do with you, that it's saying something about who you are. And so you have a very fragile ego. We see this in Jimmy, for example, when he's really insistent with Mrs. Kettleman, even after she rejects him as a lawyer, because he's not just working as a lawyer, he is a lawyer. It's part of his identity. So if someone, if he fails as a lawyer, he's failing as a person. And so he, that's why he continues to try to get Mrs. Kettleman to hire him by doing some cons with the, the redhead twins. So that's narcissism. And the second thing you need to know is that Jimmy, like everyone in this world, has an ego. An ego isn't really that you think very highly of yourself. Ego, by definition, is just the, the vision that you have on yourself your identity. When you have narcissistic traits, you need the world to confirm your identity. If you are very intelligent, you will try to say a lot of intelligent things to actually get everyone to tell you that you are in fact very intelligent and things like that. So how is Jimmy's ego? Jimmy's ego is that of a person who gets a lot of money. Representing people who have nowhere else to turn. The money is beside the point. Money is not beside the point. Money is the point. And social validation, either from his luxurious lifestyle or his performances, you know, his, his charm and his wit. That's why he put so much effort when talking to the jury in the first trial scene. Not because he really cares about his clients, because he doesn't. They're going to jail, ain't they? So since when does that matter? but just because he wants that social validation of giving a good fucking speech. And that's why he's, he's so disappointed, he's so sad, he's so angry with the life he's living right now because he's really broke and he needs to work in the back of an else alone. So that's really, really hard for him because to him it's saying that he's a failure as a person and it's not how he wants to see himself. And so this brings us to this scene. How does Jimmy get these needs met of money and social validation? Well, there are lots of ways in through which he can get them. And with every new persona he makes, Sleeping Jimmy, Saul, and eventually Gene Takovic, he gets these same needs met through different means. So now, right now, Jimmy is trying to get those needs met by being a lawyer, by being a clean, good lawyer who follows the rules. So this is really important for Jimmy's character. He isn't really prone to breaking rules, but rather he's prone to getting money and social validation. And he has to, and usually he, not, he needs to break the rules to do that. And it is exactly what he did when he was sleeping Jimmy. And that's why he remembers those, those times of sleeping Jimmy very fondly. And so when he says that Jim, sleeping Jimmy wasn't afraid of anything, wasn't afraid of winter, and then he gets afraid when she, he sees the bike, that's genius because really what Vince is telling us is that Jimmy was really scared the whole time. He was really afraid all of the time of what people would say or what the world would do to him and what that would say about him. So Sleeping Jimmy is really an attempt of Jimmy to protect his ego. And he made these personas to get this image of himself or someone who is so great and so awesome and so precious, just like Jimmy's parents told him that he was. But not our Jimmy. Couldn't be precious Jimmy. Why does Jimmy do this in this scene? 
Quit moving, you're only gonna make it worse! By this, I mean watching two people getting their legs broken. I mean, it's not something that you would like to see, so why does Jimmy stare? I think this is a beautiful detail. There's three things that this detail reveals about Jimmy, and the third one is the most interesting one in my opinion. The first one is that he looks because this is a traumatic moment in Jimmy's story. Kinda like how people can't stop watching a car crash, despite how horrible it is. So I think this is meant to represent the importance of this moment in Jimmy's story, because this is the first time that he fully immerses himself in the crime, in the game. That's the moment where he starts being in the game and swimming down and deep with these horrible characters. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that Jimmy is actually watching because he feels guilty that he got the redhead twins in trouble. Because of him, now they're getting their legs broken. Maybe this is indicating that he has a very, a very authoritarian super ego, kind of representing his big brother looking at him even when he's not there. The super ego is this part of our minds that is always watching. It's like our moral compass and stop us from doing horrible things to other people despite being nobody there to stop us, like hurting someone. So maybe this is signaling that Jimmy has a really authoritarian super ego, maybe even represented by his brother, who forces him to watch because he deserves to be punished for his actions. But the third and most important thing that this shows is that I think that it's showing a little bit of satisfaction. Jimmy is watching this because he likes it, because he actually feels proud of this, of what he's accomplished. A part of him likes watching this because it shows his accomplishments as a lawyer. He says it later that this proves that he's the best lawyer ever. He just took down a maniacal sociopath like Tuco from killing two people to just break in their legs, just using his mouth, his words. You, you, are, you are the worst lawyer, the worst lawyer ever. Hey, I just talked you down from a death sentence oh, no. to six oh. months probation. I'm the best lawyer ever. He's probably feeling super cocky after this. This, this is what he wanted. He wanted a win in the lawyer world. He wanted to prove to himself and the world that he's a good lawyer, that he is the guy for this. He can do great things in this lawyer world. And this here is the proof. So he probably, a part of him, wants to watch his beautiful works. In episode 3 of Better Call Saul, there's a genius detail hidden in this scene. Yeah, and, and you know what? Let's really have fun with this one, okay, Kettle Team? Let's do this. Here's Johnny! <laughs> the detail is Jimmy saying, here's Johnny. And it's genius when you stop and look at the first scene of this very same episode, because... Here's Johnny! Hey, I knew you'd come! So why does the episode begin and end with this very same sentence? Well, I think that Vince is trying to tell us, pay close attention to the ways in which Jimmy has changed and the ways in which he hasn't changed at all. Now he's trying to do the right thing, that thing that he does at the beginning of the episode, trying to warn the Kettlemans about Nacho trying to rob their money. It's quite a noble thing, although he himself doesn't want to admit this, because even though he's done a good thing, that doesn't mean that he's completely good, so there's a still a little bit of this feeling from Jimmy that he's not good enough. I'm no hero. But it's obvious that Jimmy is trying to improve himself, trying to be a better person. But it's so sad that the one time he tries to do a good deed, it backfires completely, because thanks to him telling that to the Gettlemans, he gets Nacho in trouble, and Nacho then is menacing him with death. So the minute he tries to change, it's like his life is going to end again. This is why it's so hard for Jimmy to change. Every time he tries to do the right thing, he gets pushed back, either from his brother or from the world in general, as if he was unable to change. We also see that it takes a lot of work from him to change, because he needs to bust his ass in his own words, trying to get a good deal for these people that are gonna pay him 
almost pennies to him. I'm busting my nut hair every day for 700 a throw, inhaling your BM, which is straight from Satan's bunghole, and you can't tell one defendant from another? So it takes a lot of work, and a lot of the times it isn't even worth it because it gets him in more trouble. So that's how Jimmy has changed, but is he still deep down the same good old sleeping Jimmy? Well, Let's look at the flashback, the things Jimmy does. At that flashback at the beginning of the episode. Because you face being labeled a sex offender, Jimmy. If that happens, it'll follow you for the rest of your life. That is insane, okay? That, that is a trumped up load of horse crap, Chuck. Come on. He takes everything personal and evades his responsibilities. It's always someone else's fault. Pure magic and make this whole situation go poof. You got a plan of attack? He expects someone to save his life when he's in trouble. Right? I know you got a million legal loopholes that we can dance through. Big bag of tricks. You know, any clever technicalities, huh? A reasonable doubt type stuff? Come on, Chuck. So he sees the entire world as just a transaction. Everything can be negotiated for. There's always a trick that can make all of your problems disappear. Okay, so how is Jimmy now? Well... Throughout the whole episode, we can see that he still sees the whole world as a transaction. I promise, on the soles of my forefathers, I will get you the stickers when I come back. I will get you extra if you just let me go. Although he does not allow the Kettlemans to negotiate with him, so I guess that's a step forward. But he still expects someone else to save his life when he talks to Kim so that he or Hamlin can get him out of trouble. They will be caught if the cops are looking for them, so you tell them to, would you? The FBI, too. I heard they're getting in on this. Why would the FBI listen to me? Well, Hamlin, they'll listen to him, right? APD, at least. You, you, you talk to Howard. You explain things to him. He has clout with these people. And he still evades his responsibilities and takes everything as if it was personal. Fine, fine, you're gonna make me walk back and get the stickers. I will walk back and get the stickers. I'm not making you do anything. Those are the rules. Craig Kettleman, yeah. The primo client your dipwad boss stole right out from under me. Nobody stole anybody, but Kettleman's made a choice. Because he did down, he's still really, really narcissistic. A narcissistic person always takes everything personal. Anything that happens to the world, it's like it's happening to him. That's why they take, they have a very fragile ego. Because they can't distinguish what happens in the world and what happens to themselves. They think they are the center of the universe. For you are making me do this. You are the... I didn't cry to my mom. He, she was the one who made it up. You didn't cry and beg mom for help. What? Jesus! She hears what she wants to hear, okay? I'm gonna cry on a payphone in the middle of Cook County Jail. Jesus! Still, these very same cycles are still... Jimmy. So in conclusion, in this episode, we learn that Jimmy is desperately trying to change, but the world is pushing him back. In a lot of ways, he hasn't changed at all. He's still that same irresponsible guy who thinks he's the center of the universe, who takes everything personally, who thinks the world is against him, so he will do whatever he needs to get ahead. Tony Curtis and Spartacus. Yeah. Like the bath scene in Spartacus. Stop talking about it. Make me beautiful. Uh -huh. The detail is that shot with the fish in the fishbowl. Because I think that that fish represents Jimmy. This is a symbol that we will see used again in future episodes. But how could a little fish represent Jimmy? Well, I think there's three reasons that explain this. The first one is the color. It's orange, and we see orange a lot in this episode. We see it when Jimmy goes to a tailor to replicate Hamlin's suit and finds an orange shirt that he will in the future wear a lot when he becomes Saul Goodman. Orange is this really bright color that really catches your eyes, almost like a color a clown would use, a showman would use to catch your attention. Color that criminals wear in jail, the orange jumpsuit. So I think that orange is meant to represent this criminal world, the criminal things that Jimmy is starting to do in this episode, because let's remember that he wants a suit like Hamlin to copy him in a billboard so that Hamlin wants to take it down so that then Jimmy can be a hero and save the poor guy who almost died trying to put that billboard down. So I think we are seeing this whole criminal side of Jimmy represented here. 
and he's absolutely loving it, which is the second reason why I think that fish represents Jimmy, because he's quite literally a fish in water. Not only because he's really good at this, I mean, it's really creative coming up with all of this scheme of wanting to copy Hamlin so that Hamlin then wants to put down the billboard so that then you can save the guy. It's a really complicated, but he seems to come up with it in nothing, so... Obviously, because he's been doing this a lot, we see it in the flashback at the beginning of this episode. One of his cons that he ran in Cicero. But we also see the main reason why he does them and why he likes them so much. I want to talk about brilliant. I mean, you're the man, me. I'm just... I love watching you work. Man. It's good for making beer money. That's about all. So it's all because of money, again, we see this before in Better Call Saul, how Jimmy is all obsessed about getting money, getting money, getting money, as if that was the only thing that mattered. You're representing people who have nowhere else to turn. The money is beside the point. Money is not beside the point. Money is the point. Because to him, it quite literally is the only thing that matters. It's the only way in which he gets value for some reason. So, get this. Jimmy was in Cicero, and he ran those cons with the whole sleeping on ice, sleeping Jimmy. He was the man. He, he received a lot of validation for that. Not only that, but he also received money. Jimmy is quite the narcissist, so he loves getting that validation. He loves getting that vision of himself, of being this successful man who gets a lot of attraction and love from people. We explored these things in the first episode of Better Call Saul, but just in case you haven't watched that. Yeah, Jimmy is this type of guy who wants a lot of validation from the world, either from showmanship or for the money he makes. And so we see in this flashback that he likes doing the cons, but they are not enough because they don't give him enough money. And now he has become a lawyer. And I think that he became a lawyer because that way he can actually get more money. If he can combine the cons with the lawyer, he can make a shitload of money. He can finally live like the king that he's, de that he's destined to live as. So yeah, he's quite literally the fish in water. And this is also what the fishbowl is representing. Fishbowl is the vicious cycle that he's in of needing this validation, this money. He's a fish in a fish pond. He's not in the ocean, swimming free, no. He's constrained in this little space of his own narcissistic tendencies, of needing this validation from the world, needing the world to support that vision of himself. Why is this scene in Better Call Saul? I found the Alpine Shepherd Boy! I'm just gonna cut it here because it's really long. It's just that Jimmy waiting in a chair for the lady to come with the Alpine Shepherd boy. I have two theories about why they show this completely unnecessary scene. The first theory is that it shows how impatient Jimmy is. I mean, the man can just stay put on that chair. He needs to pick his hair, uh, play with the pen. We see this character trait in Jimmy a lot. He's impatient emotionally because he's really quick to temper. He's impatient for business, which leads him to try to speed things up by running his scams to attract more clients. He's impatient with himself, with his own change, which leads him to again and recur to all tricks and personality traits from Sleeping Jimmy. The second theory is that it presents the Alpine Shepherd Boy as a symbol of Jimmy. What is a shepherd? The guy who takes care of the sheep, but in religion it is referred more as a, a guide, a, a leader, someone who will lead the good people to the land of the good, to the salvation, and keep away the wolves, the bad people who want to take advantage of them. That's a shepherd. And that's essentially what Jimmy is starting to do here with Elder Law, by focusing on helping the, the old people, the poor people who are defenseless without him. He is playing the shepherd, protects the sheep, and keeps away the wolves. Huh, where do we find this analogy again? There are wolves and sheep in this world, kid. Wolves and sheep. Figure out which one you're gonna be. For Jimmy, there is only wolf and sheep. There are no shepherds. So his nature tells him to be a wolf, to take advantage of the sheep instead of taking care of them. So he needs the help of other people to keep him at 
Bay to keep him in check because at the end of the day he's still a boy he's not a man he's an alpine shepherd boy he's dependent from others as any child would be he's not a full-grown man who can make his own decisions he needs someone who helps him who keeps the evil away from him who guides him and these people are Kim and Chuck I've thought about getting into elder law myself I watched my grandmother at the end it's it's awful what people have to deal with. Insurance companies, my scumbag cousins stealing her savings and her pain meds. Getting old sucks. Seniors need someone on their side. I, I'm, I'm kind of starting to specialize in elder law. Elder law. Uh, the things the elderly have to deal with. I mean, relatives coming after their savings, telemarketers, reverse mortgage scams. I mean, getting old sucks. Seniors need someone on their side, so you're looking at them. He literally goes into elder law just because Kim told him to. And he feels really compelled to prove to Chuck that he can be good. He needs his approval like a daddy. He wants him to be proud of him. That's why he makes that promise that Sleeping Jimmy will be no more. So he's a boy in search of a parent figure. He's a shepherd, but at the same time he's also a sheep, but he wants to be a wolf. So we get all of these moving parts which make this character insanely interesting. And the last part, Alpine. Alpine is a mountain, and a mountain reminds me of a trek, a trek through a mountain, an adventure, a journey. The journey that Jimmy needs to go through to turn from a boy, an Alpine shepherd boy, to a full-grown man. The question is whether he'll turn into a good man or a bad man, a wolf or a sheep. In episode 6 of Better Call Saul, Mike says something really weird. He wasn't dirty. God damn you. You get that through your head. My son wasn't dirty. It's weird because it makes no sense given what he says later in episode 9. I'm not a bad guy. No, I didn't say you're a bad guy. I said you're a criminal. I've known good criminals and bad cops, bad priests, honorable thieves. You can be on one side of the law or the other. But if you make a deal with somebody, you keep your word. You're now a criminal. Good one, bad one, that's up to you. Knowing this, it's really weird how he got so, so angry at the prospect of his son being dirty, when in reality, he should think that Mary, even though he was on the wrong side of the law, he was still a good person at heart, and it didn't matter whether he died dirty or not. In other shows, this would be a case of bad writing, but this is better called Saul, and this is done on purpose. And I think this is a really important detail because it plays into the whole dichotomy of the series of logic versus emotion. Logic is represented by Chuck. And emotion is represented by Jimmy, but there's both logic and emotion in these two characters, as there is in all people. We are all logical and also emotional beings. It is one thing to know logically that something is wrong, another thing is to know it emotionally. Chuck prides himself in his logic and his way in which he manages to destroy anyone's argument with pure logic and reasoning. But when it comes to his brother, he can't ever think straight. He thinks almost in a childish way that Jimmy is never going to change despite the proof that he has gotten that he is willing to change at least. And that he can be good sometimes when he's working with him, for instance. But there's just this emotional pull that stops Chuck from thinking straight and saying, that just Jimmy is always going to be a sleeping Jimmy and there's nothing that anyone can do about it. Chuck talks about his sacred law, about how the law is sacred and how people have to be good, but then he does a lot of horrible things to manipulate Jimmy into confessing a felony. Jimmy is the obviously more emotional one, we all know that. He's quick to temper and sometimes when he gets angry he just can't think straight. But he can also be very smart, even smarter than Chuck sometimes. But this was in work I did? Yeah, you must have missed it. Um, look, Chuck, I got lucky, right? Even a stop clock is right twice a day. And he understands himself, he understands the situation with Chuck. He knows that Chuck is a sick man and that he's probably never going to see Jimmy as an equal, as something else than just sleeping Jimmy. And even if he does, there's nothing that Jimmy can do about it. It's Chuck who needs to want to change, he can't do anything. He knows that logically. and. Kim even says so, that it's very mature of him. But then in the next scene, he has an emotional breakdown. I think that what Vince is trying to tell us here is this is just humans 101. We know that we shouldn't do certain things, but we still do them. Why do I keep doing these things 
if I know that they are not right. For instance, well, my whole life I've always been obsessed with getting good marks and getting, being smart. And I knew that that was bad and that it wasn't helping me. Quite the contrary. I didn't like caring so much about my marks and basing my value on them. And I knew it wasn't just the school's fault. There was something in me that compelled me to actually want to study more. And it was really because when I was a kid, it was because I didn't have many friends, being smart is the only thing that made me special. Now that I know where it comes from, now I know that it's nothing special, that it doesn't define my value, but now I know it for real. Now I don't not only know it intellectually, but also emotionally who I am. So yeah, that's the key. You, we need to be aware of not just of what we are doing wrong, but also why we are doing it in the first place. If not, we will always go back to just being sleeping Jimmy, just like Jimmy. <coughs> I watched episode 7 of Better Call Saul and found three really cool hidden details. The first one is in this scene. It's me, your friendly neighborhood ice man. So the detail is as Jimmy enters Chuck's house, we see a caterpillar hanging over the roof. I think this is meant to represent the moment that Chuck is in at, in this episode, because he's trying more and more to become accustomed to his sensitivity to electricity, to get over his illness and go back into the world. This could be you a perfect metaphor for how a caterpillar burst out of his cocoon, the cocoon being Chuck's house and illness and becomes a beautiful butterfly stronger than ever. That is, if he manages to get over it. The second detail is hidden in this scene. See, you can notice it. So when Jimmy opens the book to investigate and help the Kettlemans with their case, he opens the book right on a page that says electricity. And I think this is meant to be a reference to Chuck, because after this, Jimmy decides to do the right thing thing and get the money from the Kettlemans to give it back to where it belongs. So the Kettlemans go back to HHM and take the deal that Kim gave, that Kim got them. So when Jimmy gets reminded of Chuck's illness, Chuck's electricity, he decides to do the right thing. It's like Chuck is watching over him and he decides to make Chuck happy to do what Chuck thinks is best, and that's what he defines as the right thing. Which is interesting that the right thing in this case involves stealing someone's money, even if that money is already stolen. Which really fits with the themes of this series of law not defining who you are. This, it doesn't matter which side of the law you're on, what matters is your actions, if you are truly a good person at heart. You're now a criminal. Good one, bad one, that's up to you. And finally, we get this really iconic scene in this episode, with Jimmy feeling really frustrated, similar to how he feels frustrated, and hits the trash can in HHM. Why is he frustrated? Well, because it seems like every time he does the right thing, every time he tries to change for the better, the world tells him that that's not who he is, that that's not right. The world punishes him because of that. He never gets what he wants. He wants to be with Kim. No! He wants an office with Kim. Sorry, you can't have it. You have to do the right thing. And this is what will eventually keep him in that cycle of never wanting to improve himself, because what's the point? He can never change, like just like Chuck told him, so why bother? But I think that Jimmy's problem, particularly in this season and that he will repeatedly make during the series, is trying to adjust to someone else's view of what he should be of what the right thing is, because truly only one knows what's right for one. But he keeps adhering, he keeps listening to what Chuck thinks is best for him instead of what Jimmy thinks is best for Jimmy. Now obviously he can never find out what's best for himself, he can never be allowed to be himself. Just like Chuck, Jimmy needs to burst out of the cocoon of other people's expectations, particularly Chuck and even Kim's, to become his own butterfly. Law offices of James M. McGill, how may I direct your call? I watched episode 8 of Better Call Saul and found three really cool details hidden in three different scenes. The first one is hidden here. Attention, the newly passed Environmental Impact and Sustainability Assurance Act, a statute that, as you know, went into effect without any ex post facto provisions in place. You got a second, the 
I'm not really. I'm It'll just take I'm, two seconds, I promise. All right. You, you pass the bar? The detail is that it's really fitting that Chuck is using the recorder. The recorder that he will one day use to incriminate his brother to hopefully get him disbarred. So I think that's a neat detail. But why does Chuck feel so bad about Jimmy becoming a lawyer? When on one part I think that's explained in this other scene in the episode. This was in work I did? Yeah, you must have missed it. Um, look, Chuck, I got lucky, right? Even a stop clock is right twice a day. I find this so interesting how Jimmy automatically corrects himself. No, no, it's not. It's nothing special. It's nothing special. You are still really smart, Chuck. Please, please, you are smart. Jimmy is so desperate for Chuck's affection. And it shows a lot how Jimmy has probably been used his whole life to getting Chuck's affection only when Chuck is superior to him. So despite him becoming a lawyer because he wanted to make Chuck proud, he always needs to be under his heel, under him. He can never surpass Chuck because that will make Chuck feel worthless and will only increase his hatred for Jimmy. So Jimmy wants to keep it down and wants his brother to be proud of him. This is a really nice unconscious behavior that we see displayed here. But at the end of the episode, another beautiful scene happens that reveals a lot about this two's relationship. Chuck? Yeah. So Chuck goes outside and doesn't feel anything, doesn't feel his electromagnetic eye hypersensibility. So this is living proof, if we didn't believe it already, that Chuck's illness is completely mental. It's a somatization of a mental disorder, probably a narcissistic mental disorder that forces him to have everything in the world completely perfect to have everything under his control and if he can control what's outside well he will not go outside then he will stay at his house where he can control everything including Jimmy who needs to go and attend to him instead of being out there doing evil in the world as a lawyer. These are just thoughts in Chuck's brain that tell him that Jimmy is bad, that he needs to be responsible for his actions and that's why for Jimmy's actions and that's why every time Jimmy does something bad Chuck gets worse. His own narcissistic disorder punishing him for not being perfect and for not controlling the evil in his brother, for not being responsible. But at this point in the series, Chuck and Jimmy are working together in the Sam Piper case. And for once in their lives, they are brothers again. They are feeling good in it with each other's company. They are working together instead of against each other. They see each other as equals. And so Chuck, for a minute, forgets that he hates his brother, forgets that his brother is evil, and so he has no need to control him anymore. And as such, his illness momentarily disappears, until he remembers again his duty to control little precious Jimmy. In episode 9 of Better Call Saul, there's a genius detail hidden in this scene. The detail is in the lighting that the scene uses, and it's genius for two reasons. The lighting in Better Call Saul is genius in itself because it uses two distinct colors to signify law and crime. For law, it uses blue, mostly, the hamlindigo blue of HHM. So when we see a character covered in blue, it usually means that they are covered in law, that they are navigating the world of law. And if we see it in a golden light, it means that they are in the world of crime, which also symbolizes the two distinct plot lines that Better Call Saul has. One is the plot line of the law of Jimmy and Chuck and Kim, and the other is the crime plotline of Mike and Gus. The second reason why it's genius is because golden light is usually used with Jimmy, for obvious reasons. He is the one who leans onto the crime side much more, and blue is used more with Chuck. But in this scene, for the first time in the whole season, the roles are inversed. Jimmy is covered in blue light, showing how he's actually capable of good 
at least when he's supervised by others or he's feeling loved and valued. And Chuck is covered in that golden criminal light, as to show that he isn't as good a person as he thinks he is. And in general, this portrays the idea that the series wants to convey of people not really being good or bad, but somewhere in the middle. That good people are capable of doing bad things, and that bad people can also be capable of doing good. That people can actually change for the better if given the right circumstances. Not Nobody is truly good or evil, but we are mostly great. And it is in our, in our power to lean towards one or the other. You're now a criminal. Good one, bad one. That's up to you. In episode 10 of Better Call Saul, there's an insane detail hidden in this scene. See if you can notice it. So the detail is that shot with Jimmy looking at the right side of the frame. Okay, if you don't get why that's an insane detail, it's because you first need to watch this other scene. When he sees that coin with Kennedy facing east, facing the American past, pissed him off. They say he went rogue. Without telling anybody, he flipped things around so that Kennedy was facing west towards the new frontier. So I can't be the only one who sees the similarities between that shot and how the face on a coin looks. I think this is meant to represent three different things. On the one hand, it represents the past. Jimmy says it in the scene. Looking right, looking east represents the past. The past that now Jimmy is leaving behind because until now he was still practicing his fantasy of fitting into this good corporate lawyer world. A lawyer who does good for his clients without any other scan without sleeping Jimmy. But after the disappointment of learning that Chuck was always against him, he decides to give up. He decides to stop looking at the past and leave it all behind, just like Kim says. I think you should take the deal. You'll find yourself a proper office, your office, you'll build your practice, you'll leave Hamlin and HHM behind. Be your own man. The problem is, it's only that past of being a good lawyer that he leaves behind, because he still hangs on to an even more distant past, the past of being sleeping Jimmy. Those cons that he learned at a young age are the ones that he will apply as this new scammy lawyer. And that's precisely the second thing that this shot represents, because the coin that looks right is a true coin, is a valid coin, but the coin that looks left is a false one, is the one that you use to scam someone. So this is reinforcing that point of Jimmy turning into that fake coin that scams people. But I think this also means that him being this scammy false coin is that this isn't Jimmy's true self. This is just the person that Jimmy is forced to become to survive in the world, to keep that feeling that he's the successful person that he always wanted to be. So he's giving up being his true self in favor of being someone that he sees as better or superior. 